Hey you guys and girls, how are you? Good to see you. It is Cold Justice Saturday. It was a uh, good episode, one that if you've been in true crime for a while, you may have actually come across. I know Morbility, is that the right podcast? I know they did it at one point, and uh, it is, if I can find it, yep. Don't know if you guys recognize this photo. It is Jennifer Servo from Abilene, Texas. And um, yeah, I actually know this one. It's one that's been around oh, 20, 20 years, something like that. A while. And it's sort of been a cold case for, you know, most of its time uh, that it's been around. There's two suspects. Both were love interests of uh, Jennifer's in different ways. One was a relationship that was sort of, they were both sort of ending, but one that she wasn't that interested in and another guy that, well, he was a nice guy, but he sort of just wasn't her type in the end, I think. He just was a bit not the, you know, just he was a bit incompatible with her personality in certain ways. He was a little shy, he was a little meek, and I don't think that's what she was looking for. I think she was looking for more of a manly man, and that wasn't him, apparently. Hey, LMS, how are you? Oh, uh, LMS says, Prayers needed lost a childhood friend yesterday in an accident in Florida where they live now. Uh, sorry to hear that, LMS. What a horrible thing after you had just got your new job this week that is not the uh news that anyone wants that's horrible hey bullseye hey bullseye giddy up all right so i wish i could show you the trailer for this but i can't because it is uh <laughs> it's the geo restricted now reby did set me up with a vpn i've just got to connect it and log in and test it out so hopefully by next week uh we'll be able to do that and we'll be able to watch the trailers and get to the news sites again uh but it's good to see you all before we get started marilyn landis how are you mama mia dj how are you mama mia again diamond heart moonlight view nancy s nancy s thank you very much for your uh, monthly membership i i received that for some reason, they come out a couple of days before the start of the month, and it always scares me because I think, oh my god, someone donated, and it's like midnight, and I'm like, what's going on? But no, it's just a monthly uh, membership. But thank you, Nancy. That helps a lot. Sienna, how are you, my dear? And uh, who else is here? Diamond Heart. Back again. Mamma Mia. Lula. Hey, Lula. How are you, my friend? LMS. Bullseye. Just trying to see if I missed anyone. No? Did I miss anyone? Maria? All right, that's fine. If I missed anyone, hide a blanket hello to hello to those people. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, fist bump. There you go. All right. So the team heads to Abilene, Texas. We've been there before. Uh, they're headed to I'm gonna say it wrong. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'll just I'll I'll just skip it. It's not really that important. Um but the case tonight, like I said, based on two love interests, one, one, like I said, was a bit meek, a bit shy of a guy, nice guy. Everyone couldn't speak any bad words about him, but he's been a suspect in this case on and off for about 20 years. Now, what happened tonight in this episode, I think will, uh, you know, bring a lot of joy to some people in his circles. But there's another guy, another guy that she was with, and I'm going to get you both their names in a second. He was, he followed her to Texas, and even when she she told him, don't come, I need some time to kind of get my life together, you know, I kind of, I kind of want to move to Texas and do my own thing. Uh, sh you know, he followed her all the way down there, and forced his way into her apartment to, as a live-in boyfriend, mooched off, to, mooched off her, didn't work, she worked, 
and uh, took money from her financially until she finally had enough and kicked him out of the house not long before she was murdered. Now, you know, I don't understand uh, how a lot of people had a difference of opinion on this over the years. A lot of people think it was the meek boyfriend that, that killed her and uh, not the other guy. But this guy, I, one of the interesting details is this. Not long after Jennifer's murder, he re-enlisted in the army and disappeared, didn't contact anyone that knew Jennifer after she was killed, didn't go to her funeral, and just went went off overseas or wherever they went to re-enlist and, you know, erased himself from Texas for a while. And tonight on the show, they took a very dim view to someone who would do that, to apparently someone he loved very much back only in 2002. Now, I agree. Now, his name is Ralph uh, Sepulveda. I'm probably saying that wrong with my Spanish accent, but there you go. An army ranger who met Servo while training with the reserves in Montana. According to Servo's mother and sister, Sepulveda and Servo were in the early phases of their romantic relationship when Servo announced the boyfriend would join her in Texas. Now, apparently that's not what happened. Yeah, he sort of forced his way in and bullied her into taking him to Texas with her because he was possessive, controlling, didn't want her to be with anyone else. And yeah, you guys have seen it all before. It says, Jennifer and Ralph had instant chemistry. They only knew each other about a month before he decided to uproot his life and aggressively pursued her. But within weeks, Jennifer realized she'd made a mistake. The couple only lived together a few weeks before Servo kicked uh, kicked him out after feeling misled. Servo learned Sepulveda had a fiancé and a child from another relationship back in Montana, details he'd withheld before moving into Servo's new residence. Um, apparently, he subsequently moved into another apartment nearby in Abilene. So it says, before long, Servo had a brief romantic fling with her 24-year-old co-worker and weatherman named Brian Travers, Travers and Servo ran errands together hours before Servo's time of death, and based on entry in Servo's diary, it seemed like he was more into her than she was into him. Now, there's there's your two suspects, one, a co-worker, and two, the possessive boyfriend who forced his way into her life, uh, her new life in Texas, all the way from Montana. It's a, it's a hell of a trip to take for a one-month relationship i don't know many people that would do that it's not you know it's not a lifetime movie um it says here uh, this is about the uh, show sorry they're saying one of the things that they I'll, I'll remove it up here so you guys can't see that it says one of the things that uh jennifer found out about Sepulveda is he liked to choke women during sex, including her, and she wasn't really a fan of this. And this was one of the things she had told her girlfriends about, that she was very unhappy about their sex life because he was very aggressive, often uh, strangling her, like almost to near blackout. And this is one of the reasons she actually wanted to break up with him. And so you got a guy who you know it's in some some people would call it abuse uh, sexual abuse in a relationship he, he followed her possessively all the way from montana all the way to texas and forced his way into her apartment only for her to end up kicking him out only three weeks after they got there i i mean it paints a picture it paints a picture to me Oh, yeah, I don't, I haven't, I know Woos was not feeling so great a week or two ago. I don't know where, what's going on now, but I hope she's feeling okay. Yeah, so this, this case is really, um, I reckon it paints a picture anyway. It says here, as seen in police video obtained and published by Cold Justice, I'll show you some uh, screenshots of that when we get back on the late show, because I have to get through the video and break it down like we did last week. I can't do it in 10 minutes. Uh, it says, Servo's fully clothed body was discovered slumped over a bathtub. J 
Drag marks of blood appeared to start on the floor near the victim's bed, which was stationed in the living room, and track through the living room into the bedroom. So the way that they sort of demonstrated this was someone had picked her up by the ankles and then dragged her part of the way down through the two rooms and then near the near the bathroom. When they had to turn a corner, they grabbed her by the hands and then dragged her the rest of the way and then pulled her up and over the bathtub and left her slumped into the bathtub. That's sort of the way they describe that. And I will show you some photos um, of them demonstrating that on the late show. It's a bit hard to mem- like, you know, visualize. It says here, a postmortem examination stated Servo died of manual stra- strangulation and was dead before the upper portion of her body entered the water. So before she was slumped over the bathtub, she was already dead. Experts found bruising around the exterior of Servo's genitals though it didn't appear that she was sexually assaulted. Now, they do address that too. They think it may have been while someone was applying pressure to her neck, they may have had their knee in her, you know, vagina or, you know, whatever the, that outside part you want to call it. You know, I think they had force on that area in the groin area with their knee while they were trying to strangle, strangle her. That's the way they demonstrated it in the show. Um, and it says seeing a servo was fully dressed it didn't seem likely given the chaotic scene that an assailant would have you know r-worded servo and then put her clothes back on although that has happened in other cases i don't think it's they said it was just too chaotic in the time frame didn't match for someone to <clears throat> someone to um you know do a full you know a full r-word and then get her redressed and then drag her here and put her over a bathtub they're like no it's not that type of uh you know murder and sexual assault although you know that we've seen that in other ones just not this one and here's here's the explanation that i just told you it says bruising around the vagina was theorized to be caused by the assailant's knee during the act of strangulation like i explained to you a minute ago they explain the crime scene looks chaotic like someone is panicking they're grabbing stuff from here and there and trying to figure out what they're going to do. Yeah, so they're saying that it was... Um, they're saying that the whole scene just didn't look like it had been planned. It looked like it was an act of, you know, sudden violence or a argument that got out of hand or there was no planning. It wasn't, you know, some spy mission that, you know, it was just, just chaotic. It was not something that was plan detail to detail and then you know methodically done it was all over the place it says here dna from travers semen was found on servo's bed but it didn't prove anything criminal since he was in a relationship with servo of course travers was also uh travers also volunteered his dna to help further the investigation and apparently he also had been chasing leads in the case over the years asking around for information like two different police and uh, co-workers and other people surrounding the case and they said that lends a uh, some credibility to his uh, you know that he's not involved because someone who did the crime isn't going to be going around going hey do you have any new leads in the woman I killed like no one's going to do that if you were involved so they're saying you know he seemed like just a pretty decent guy it says, a lack of forced entry into the apartment led detectives to conclude that Servo probably knew her killer. The theory was also supported by a neighbor's statement that they heard Servo and another arguing for some time. Siegler, Kelly Siegler says, what a violent, horrible crime. I don't know if the person who did this came over here intending to hurt Jennifer or if this is an unplanned action of an obsessive, jilted lover. I think it's this one, the second one. It's an unplanned action of an obsessive jilted lover. Something has probably pushed them over the edge. Now, they said that uh, Travis was with Jennifer not long before she was murdered. They theorized that maybe, maybe uh, Sepulveda saw them together and that pushed him over the edge to, one, start a violent confrontation with Jennifer 
but then maybe he took it too far because he just snapped he's like oh my god she's with another another man how dare she we're together it's it's our relationship why is she seeing this guy at work what's going on and they think possibly he snapped uh it says on on upon review of the victim's final hour, hours authority stated servo and travis left work around 11 30 p.m and shopped together soon after as was confirmed by the store's surveillance footage, they left at around 12.30 a.m. on September 16, 2002. Servo and a friend spoke on the phone after Servo returned to the ap- apartment, hanging up around 1.39 a.m. Police said Travers was cooperative during the initial investigation and even helped officers in a walkthrough of the victim's apartment. He also reported seeing a strange car hours before someone committed the murder. And the way they... um sort of talk about this and it's here in this next paragraph is they sort of think someone was tailing them or spying on them or keeping an eye on jennifer and what 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 she was up to with other men and that could be ralph down here mr ralph sepulveda it says he told detectives he was at home and went to sleep at around 10 30 p.m after watching football alone it's a great alibi says Detective Bell said he grew quickly suspicious of Sepulveda's matter-of-a-fact demeanor. He was not emotional in any form or fashion, just didn't ask any of the right questions. Uh, Jennifer's dead, and he's like, oh, that sucks. He never asked, how did she die? What happened to her? Never asked for details that you would expect. You know, someone you love and were in a relationship with, you moved all the way to Texas together, and you're still trying to win back. You're still trying to get back in her life. You wouldn't just be like, oh, yeah, that, that sucks. I can't believe she died. You would you would be like, oh, my God, who killed her? Do you know who killed her? How did this happen? Do you have any suspects? Like, it's really telling when people don't ask those type of questions. And they actually go back and visit him uh, in the later in the episode. And he basically tells them that, oh, I've given you everything I can give you you know 20 years ago i have no interest in talking to you i've told you my my side of the story and i have nothing more to add and he basically shut down all conversation and when they walked away from that very short conversation they both said don't you find it weird that he didn't ask us if we'd found a killer or if we have any new suspects and like they basically said yeah because he knows he's the main suspect and uh that was very telling now, this is that could be TV magic, but it was an interesting moment. It says, Sepulveda moved from Abilene just weeks, weeks after her death and re- re-enlisted in the U.S. Army for active duty. Sepulveda cut ties with any mutual acquaintances of Servo's while Travers, con- uh, contrastingly, attended Servo's funeral, kept in touch with the victim's family over the years. Yeah, apparently he even kept in touch with, um, I think it's her mom, and was, you know touching base every now and then is there any news can i help with anything and uh yeah you can see the completely different ways these two people went about it it says whether it was brian or ralph or an unknown attacker we have a better appreciation now of how this murder was very close and an intimate ordeal uh let's see if i can find something here Yeah, so one of the one of the things here is that Servo had just returned from running errands with Travers. What I do know is that her door was locked, a friend told Cold Justice. She would not have just opened it, in my opinion, for a stranger. Some says Travers carried a torch for Servo, while <coughs> Servo told people she regretted having sex with Travers. They both remained friendly. However, witness after witness claimed Travis was far from violent. Yeah, they referred to him as like the news station sweetheart. That's how they described him. Nice guy, you know, typical nice dude. You, you know, not going to hurt anyone. Overly, overly sweet to everyone and always wants to help, that type of thing. It says, however, many acquaintances cited problems between Servo and Ralph. Uh, that's Sepulveda, claiming Sepulveda left his long-term girlfriend in Montana to follow Servo to Texas. Yeah, he was already already in a relationship in Montana 
already had a child back there and then got infatuated with uh, Jennifer and followed her all the way to Texas. Uh, you know, you can try and paint your own mind visual of, of how this is going. Hey, Andrew says, how are you? Mary L, he could be a cocktail. How my sweetheart? How are you? Obsession. Yeah, that's the that's the uh, that's the picture I get when I watched it. Is that obsessive personality? Something sparks his interest, and he's like, you know, like a dog and a squirrel. He's like, oh my god, a squirrel, and that's the kind of the uh, you know personality I get, and very. Um, <clears throat> very snap decisions he moved to texas just on like oh you're going to texas i want to go to texas too hey but don't you have a child and a another woman up here yeah yeah but that's fine i want to go to texas with you i mean most people would be like moving to texas really of a relationship of only four weeks oh, i don't know about that it's a it's a big commitment you know it's a lot of money I don't know if I want to do that. I have to start over in a whole new city. There's a lot of things to contemplate here. Uh, so you can see <laughs> it's they're saying the murder was sort of like a snap decision too. You can see some key things that sort of follow. It says the cold justice team wondered if the suspicious car following Servo and Travis hours before the murder was driven by the jealous ex-boyfriend, Sepulveda. Maybe. Could be. So soon after Servo's death, investigators obtained a love letter that, love letter that Sepulveda penned to his ex-girlfriend in 2002, suggesting he no longer had feelings for Servo and still loved the former fiancé in Montana. The woman claimed that she and Sepulveda had been together for three years. She said she spent the summer of 2002 in Phoenix, Arizona for work, during which time Sepulveda was developing a new life. She said, I finally tracked him down through one of his co-workers and she put him on the phone and he said that he had met someone else and he didn't love me anymore. He was moving, said the ex. I never heard from him again. So she's never heard from him again. Why did he write this letter up here saying that, you know, he still loved her and, you know, all this type of stuff? I wonder if it was a a CYA letter. Now, what's a CYA letter, Ping? It's a cover your ass letter. And I wonder if the, he wrote that to give him some sort of credibility should he ever be investigated later on. He could say, well, no, I, was, I wasn't pursuing a relationship with Jennifer. I was going to go back to Montana or Arizona and be with my ex-girlfriend. I, I had no interest in her. So I wonder if it was a CYA letter. It says, uh, the former girlfriend's statement told investigators that since Sepulveda made zero attempts to rekindle his relationship with the woman, the love letter written around the time of Servo's death was likely bogus. Yes, it probably was bogus. Uh, hold on, give me a second. Hey, Nanalana, how are you? Mary L, Ginger Porter's here? Oh my god, it's a celebrity. How are you, Ginger? Hey, Gambler, how are you? I think everyone should check in on Gambler. It says here, hi everyone, late joining in, one of my cousins called to check in on me. Everyone call Gambler and check in on him at least twice a week, okay? Everyone, for at least a couple of months. <laughs> call call Gambler in Canada and uh, check in on him. Uh, you, you like that one, a CYA letter? Yeah, get, get something to eat. Maybe something soft, like soup. Um, it says here, uh, Investigator Spignola and APD Detective Roger Romero headed to pay Travis a surprise visit at his dead, uh, Des Moines, Iowa residence. No one answered the door, but Travis called the investigators, later agreeing to speak with his attorney present. Now, he went into that interview with his attorney, his attorney basically said, don't answer any questions. But apparently Travis did want to help. And he answered a few of their questions that his attorney would allow him to answer. They came away from that meeting actually feeling quite good. They said, if 
you know, the first meeting that they would have had would have been, uh, you know, he was the attorney would have said, are you guilty? Did you do this crime? And they, if that's true, they would never allow him to answer even a single question ever again. But the fact the attorney did allow him to answer a couple of questions was uh, they said that he's probably told the lawyers that he didn't do the crime and they didn't believe he'd done the crime either. The fact he was forthcoming, he really wanted to answer questions, but his representative was telling him, you know, don't say shit to these guys. So, guys, give me one second. My cat is whacking on this door. Hold on. Sorry, the cats are at the door. Uh, both of them. They're like, Dad, we can hear you talking. Let us in. Let, let us in. We want to go on the show. Uh, yeah, so they went back. They spoke to Travers. His uh, representation was with was with him. And they, they said they felt good because they said, you know, most attorneys are going to not allow you to answer anything at all. They said when they visited... Sepulveda, they said he came out as guarded. They gave him this, uh, this is what he said. He said, you know, it's been so long. I haven't talked to anybody about it in a long time. There's nothing else I could add to that. Absolutely nothing. And he was sitting there with like his arms crossed up in a corner, uh, you know, very on guard. They said for detectives, Sepulveda's guarded manner rang as suspicious they said he wouldn't divulge any new information to us. He gave us nothing. He strikes me as like he d still doesn't give a shit. He never asked us, how's the case coming? Are there any new leads? Who's your main suspect? And they explained, yeah, because he knows. He's probably the main suspect because he probably did it, allegedly. It says, back in Des Moines, without cold justice cameras rolling, Travis cooperated with investigators with nothing in his history pointing to violence, coupled with a mountain of witness statements attesting to his wholesome character. Investigators didn't believe Travis made for a strong suspect in the case. Yes, after 20 years, they actually were able to finally, very publicly, cross him out as a, a suspect in Jennifer's murder. And they said that's got to feel really good for Travis, someone who this murder has really dogged his life for most of his adult life now and it's really it's apparently it's cost him jobs it's cost him relationships and he hasn't done anything wrong all he did was he fell for a very beautiful young lady probably he was way into her more than she was ever into him and uh, that was his only crime his only crime was falling in love with her a little too much they said, will there be justice for Jennifer? It says, Brian Travis has cooperated with the police department since day one, even against the advice of his own lawyers. He's even given DNA. He flew up to Montana to her funeral and grieved with her family and friends as, and has continued to email Jennifer's mom about the case. That doesn't seem like someone who committed the murder and killed their daughter. It seems like someone who generally feels bad about what happened and it still affects them to this day as well. It says, Siegler maintained Travis' only mistake was falling too hard for Servo. Like I said before, the team concluded that Sepulveda's felt slighted when Servo kicked him out of the home upon discovery of his ex and a child. They theorized he became even more jealous when learning about Travis. Match with Sepulveda's alleged perchance for sexual strangulation, his purported bogus lo uh, love letter, his quick military re-enlistment following Servo's death, and his stoic demeanor when being interviewed, authorities felt they had enough case to present to the district attorney's office in hopes of charging Sepulveda with murder. It says Brian Travis has been cleared of uh, cleared as a suspect. That's great news. They finally got to give a guy his life back. You know, everyone's going to see this episode, hopefully a lot of people in his town and work and things like that.
and he'll they'll be able to say, you know, we're sorry for judging you, and uh, hopefully he'll get a little bit of his uh, reputation and life back. That would be nice, right? The thing I want to talk about is this. I have noticed uh, on cold justice episodes in the last three years, you'll have a great case like this. You'll get to the end. They'll be like, oh my God, we think we know who the murderer is. We're going to take it to the DA's office. And you're like, oh my God, they're going to press him with murder. We're going to get seen be arrested. It's going to be great. No, you get to the end of the episode and they're like, Oh, so our DA uh, says there's a couple of things they want us to take care of. And, uh, you know, but it's definitely going to happen. It's it's 100% going to happen. Just give us some more time. And, uh, you know, we just got to tidy a couple more things up. And then we'll, we'll definitely get charges for Jennifer. Definitely, 100%, you know. Just give us a little more time. Well, it's um, many months later. It's probably eight months since since filming and nothing at least i haven't been able to find anything maybe i'm wrong but you would think they published this article today march 30 2024 at 8 p.m if they had pressed charges in the last however long since filming you would think there would be a big edit down the bottom here saying since the time of filming uh, the attorney's district attorney's office has finally pressed charges against Sepal Vita with murder, but nothing. I can't find anything that says that they are even close. And this has happened on a bunch of cases on cold justice, almost like they don't want to finish the episode saying they failed. They just like, oh, we'll use that DA trick again. We'll use that DA thing and, and get people's hopes up because I've seen it on about, I don't know, every second case or every third case and i don't know i don't know if it's some tv magic or it's a real thing i I don't know but it is a bit annoying when you get to the end of the episode and they've got a strong case they think they know who did it and you get no no payoff at the end no payoff for the victim no payoff for the uh viewers nothing and it's, uh, you know, they just say, oh, our DA definitely wants to pursue charges. And you check into the case after the episode and nothing has happened in many months. So it can't be that strong of a case because they, they still haven't pressed any charges. Let me just double check. I don't think so, though. No. I haven't. No, no, I can't see anything. Let me check out Wikipedia. Nope. No, they're just saying that uh, Ralph Ralph uh, Sepulveda is the prime suspect at this time. That's it. So that's the episode. If you can tune into the late show uh, at about midnight Eastern, I will have a whole bunch more court documents, screenshots, and other things from the show that we can have a look at that'll detail it. This is sort of just a quick run by. We're, we're only an hour removed from the episode, and we jumped on about half an hour after the episode aired. So, hey, Sherry, how are you? I purchased a brand new riding mower, and I'm over the moon. Isn't that cool, Sherry? I hope you have fun with it. Be careful with it. People get killed by those every day. Be very careful. Take a ride-on mowing safety driver's course is there such a thing (laughs) i don't know uh maybe there is defensive driving of ride on mowers is that a real a real course you could take marilanda says they leave you hanging yes i i think that is a way of putting it that well it's not just us it's the family too there was there was one we actually spoke about i think it's uh episode two of this this season a few weeks ago the family was out here this year saying that since the episode uh, aired and was recorded they've had nothing from the police department to the point where now they are funding their own uh, billboards in town asking for more information because this whole oh the DA really wants to help and press charges nothing they just heard nothing since and 
Now they feel like it's back to being their job to find justice for their relative. And uh, so, yeah, they funded a billboard to put up on the main street in town and it has a phone number. Have you seen, do you know anything about our relative? Can you call this number if you were around in 1995? Do you know anything about her murder? That type of thing. Oh, can can I put your email in here? Yes. Uh, Sunday. Wait. Yes, Sunday. There you go. Why, was someone asking for my email? I was trying to find it. No one in chat. Oh, if we mean for you, Moonlight View? Oh, it's for Peekaboo Cockatiel. Hey, Peekaboo, you can have my email. There you go. Sorry, I didn't see who asked for it. Hey, Amy, how are you? Amy, is it you that sent me that story last night about about Ariel Garcia? Are you the same, Amy? Am I getting the right person? Uh, we did actually air the update about Ariel Garcia two nights ago, and he unfortunately was found dead. Uh, after they put out that Amber Alert, they found his body. At around 5.55 p.m., the Everett Police Department was notified that a body was located at a location outside of Everett, and subsequently they ended up charging his mum with murder. Now, we found out later on that his grandmother had actually applied to the court a couple of days before he went missing and was subsequently killed, that she had actually approached the court to take guardianship of Ariel Garcia because the mum was unfit to parent him. So, very, very sad case. Very, very sad case. And uh, a little boy dead, unfortunately. Yeah, I can show you. Yeah. That's little uh er that's little Ariel Garcia. And uh yeah, they found his body. And then we're able to dig up that other information about the grandma that she had actually applied for custody of him. It just it didn't happen fast enough and I don't know if maybe the custody thing sparked something with the mother and that's why the boy ended up deceased i don't know but uh it doesn't matter because a little boy a little four-year-old boy is dead so we'll, we'll find out what happens with the mom we'll find out how are you all what is going on who's got groceries oh i, th I thought it said my groceries very cool but it says my gracious very cool let me see how you all are doing uh, yeah, so come to tune back in on the late show, and I will give you the more in depth on Jennifer Servo, and we'll have a lot more photos and diagrams and things like that that we can go through. I I wish there was a faster way to do it, but unfortunately, when the episode airs at eight p.m. and then finishes at nine, and then we come on just after nine, not much we can do. By the way, I want to, huh, by the way, I just want to uh, say hi to Julie, our friend Julie, and uh, I wanted to say I am so sorry to hear that you're not in the best of ways at the moment, and I hope you're going to feel better shortly, my friend. I know maybe you're out there listening and not in the chat, so I'll give you a wave. And uh, Julie, please recover quickly. And uh, we love you and come back soon, okay? I will send you a reply to your email this afternoon. But uh, thanks for your email and thank you for your donation. I appreciate it. That was very kind of you. Diagrams, yes, we'll have more diagrams, <laughs> more Venn diagrams and flow charts. We'll have many flow charts for you. All right, let's see what else we have. I just wanted to run through that quickly. Why is this a headline story? 
sorry, someone just sent me a thing saying uh, the mother of the four-year-old Washington State boy found dead along Inter Interstate 5, which is Ariel Garcia, uh, has been charged with murder. But wasn't she charged with murder two days ago? Hold on. Her name is Jeanette Garcia. Hold on, everyone. Let me find Ariel Garcia. I thought she was charged with murder like two days ago. Oh, she was arrested in connection with the homicide. Okay. She was only arrested a couple of days ago. She's now been charged with the murder. Okay. That's what happened. Okay. Thank you for uh, pointing out that difference. Yes. So I can see here. A couple of days ago, she was arrested for murder uh, after, in Vancouver after missing four-year-old son found dead. And then about an hour ago, it says, missing four-year-old boy's body found, mother Jeanette Garcia arrested in connection with his murder. And then it says she was charged with murder too. So I don't know if these happened at different periods of time. Yeah, a Washington mother accused of killing her preschool-aged son was arrested the day after his body was found off an interstate and is now facing charges. Jeanette Garcia, 27, from Everett, Washington, was placed in the custody by Clark County Sheriff's Office for making false and misleading statements a few hours after her four-year-old son, Ariel Garcia, was reported missing by a relative on Wednesday. And then it says Thursday... They found the body of Ariel just off an interstate in Pierce County, about an hour south of Seattle. And then on Friday, uh, Jeanette was arrested by Everett Police Department and was booked into Sonomish County Jail on the following charges. First degree murder, second degree murder, and assault of a child in the first degree. So there you go. Uh, she has now been charged. Street justice. Thanks, Amy, if you're listening. Woman suspected of kidnapping and killing girl. Yeah, we will do that one. Thank you. Um, yeah, so what does it say here? They're saying, according to the statement, the dep uh, department's major crimes detectives from the Everett Police Department are actively involved in the case and will continue to investigate the department asked people with information regarding the incident to call or email their tip lines at 425-257-8450 or tips at everettwa.gov. So if you know anything and you're out there, email them or call them. Let me pause that. Um, yeah, very sad case, especially because someone did want him. The grandmother wanted him, you know. The grandmother wanted to take guardianship of of him and it just didn't happen fast enough unfortunately hey leisha how are you my friend oh it's this amy hey amy hey andrew how are you my friend oh you missed that uh that's okay it's all good What, a, a Kia Forte or Fort? Same color, dark sky blue, 2024 Kia Fort. I don't know what that means. Are we talking about suspicious cars or cars that you have purchased? Oh, she bought a new car. Okay. Happy that you bought a new car, Marilyn Landis. I hope it serves you well. Okay. Let's see what else we've got. Do we have any other big updates? Ah, this might be interesting to you all. Let me see if I can bring it up. Man arrested on first degree murder charge after roommate is found buried in the backyard. What the hell? All right, let's watch the video. check leads to a man found buried in his own backyard his roommate tonight charged with his murder 
Thank you so much for joining us tonight at 6. I'm John Evans. I'm Francis Weller. Lawrence Grabka, who went by Larry, was reported missing yesterday. Deputies went to his home on Myrtle Grove Road to look for him. Detectives also talked to his roommate, Elvin Baca. Forensics investigators said they soon realized that someone had killed Grabka and they found his body in a shallow grave. WECT's Ava Brengord talked to a close friend who says Grabka didn't deserve to die like this. For people who knew Larry Grabka, it seems unthinkable. His body buried right here in his own backyard along Myrtle Grove Road. The person accused of killing him, his own roommate. Now his friends and family remember him as a kind-hearted soul and a loving father. No, he's, he's with the angels. I'm sorry. That's the reaction from Catherine Roosh, Larry Grabka's close friend and former roommate. He was the sweetest man in the world. Did not deserve this. I warned him, get rid of this guy. And uh, he was so nice that he didn't want to kick him out on the street. That guy she's referring to is Elvin Baca, who now faces first degree murder charges. Bruce says she always felt something wasn't right about him. Did you ever think he was capable of anything like this? I, I personally did. And that's why I told Larry for a long time. Something's not, you know, he's not right, Larry, and you don't know what he's capable of. So, you know, please, let's get somebody else to rent the room. She recalls the last time she saw Baca, when she believes he had already killed Grabka before burying him in their backyard. The area is marked here in white. What's going through my head is I saw the man the night that he probably did it because I he Larry wasn't answering his phone, so I stopped in and Larry wasn't home. And then Carlos is what he went by, was sitting in his car. He said he hadn't seen him and he smiled at me and told me he loved me. Yeah, I can't get that image out of my head. She's trying to replace that memory with that of her close friend who was now gone forever. He was, he was just the kind of guy that, you know, if you met him, you'd, you'd want to, chat with him. You'd want to talk to him and, and get to know him better. He was just a sweetheart. Baca is being held in jail right now without bond. If he is convicted for first degree murder, he could face the death penalty. In Wilmington, Abra Ringort, WECT. Was I the only one that was very confusing to listen to? It was like Gravka and Bravka and Baca they all murdered each other or someone died. Amy, that's okay. That is fine. You can do whatever you like. It's all good. Okay, so one of them is <laughs> Elvin Noel Barker appeared in the court. He's the one who is uh, charged with first degree murder and conceal failed to report a death. His victim is Lawrence Grabka a 69-year-old male. So apparently he was letting him stay there and he was, he didn't want to be mean and kick him out and he ended up killing him. How is that? I mean, he was trying to be kind to someone and that kindness ended up in his death. I mean, like she said, she's trying to get that image out of her mind of him, you know, saying that, you know, she hadn't seen him and that he loved her. Like, I mean, I can understand why she finds that chilling, especially because he was, you know, he killed her friend. I mean, yeah, but Barker and Grabka, there you go. I mean, I've never seen such a closely similarly named people in one story before. Now, it says the victim, Lawrence, uh, was reported missing yesterday by a friend. Sheriff's Office deputies responded to 5501 Myrtle Grove Road for a check welfare. Deputies met with Elvin Noel Barker, a 34-year-old male and roommate of Gravka. Detectives arrived on the scene and began their investigation. He ended up being charged with first-degree murder and the conceal failed to report a death. And he buried him in that backyard. They even showed you that little patch. There it is. 
It's outline, outlined in white. There you go. That's where they found his body. Uh, I mean, that's brutal. I, I hate when they leave stuff like that there. I know they have to do it for a forensic or whatever, but uh, it's almost like a reminder to the family. It's like, do you remember we saw that one in uh, Florida? And they're like, oh, yeah, we just dug up some feet. There was a couple of feet in the backyard, and we just dug them up. I mean, <laughs> and then they're like, yeah, we just left the hole where the feet were. If you guys remember that one from a couple of weeks ago. And they're like, there's a hole where the feet were. It is very sad, especially because someone tried to provide someone with a, a roof over their head and some stability in their life, and it was repaid with a violent act of murder. I mean, that's why people are, are very reluctant to uh, do favors for people or be nice to people or let people into their lives because they occasionally hear stories like this where people are repaid either being ripped off, stolen from, killed assaulted hurt and it's a shame because we need people to be nice to each other in the world and uh it's a shame that these type of stories don't help and they get people to be more closed off to other people but uh you know you got to protect yourself as well you got to got to make sure you're safe let me see if i can find any other details here It says, Kathleen Roosh knew Grabka very well. She called him her best friend. The two were former roommates before Barker moved in. Roosh remembers Grabka, who goes by the name Larry, as a kind-hearted friend. She said, he's the sweetest man in the world. He did not deserve this. She said, Roosh always felt something wasn't right about Barker. She said, I warned him, get rid of this guy. And he was so nice that he didn't want to kick him out on the street. That's why I told Larry for a long time, he's not right, Larry. You don't know what he's capable of. So please, let's get somebody else to rent the room. Roosh recalled the last time she saw Barker, whom she believes he had already killed Grabka before burying him in the backyard. She said, I saw Barker that night, the night he probably did it. Larry wasn't answering his phone, so I stopped in and Larry wasn't home. Barker was sitting in his car. He said he hadn't seen him and he smiled at me and told me. He loved me. Yeah, I can't get that image out of my head. Yeah, that's what she said on the video. Uh, let me see if I can find anything else about the Evelyn Noel Barker. Let's have a look. North Carolina man charged with allegedly, allegedly murdering his roommate. From Yahoo News. It even made it to Australia. Yeah, North Carolina man charged with allegedly murdering and burying his roommate in a shallow backyard grave. There's a photo of him from the New Hanover County Sheriff's Office. There we go. It says a North Carolina man has been charged with first degree murder and failure to report a death after the body of his roommate was discovered buried in a shallow grave in the backyard. Damn. Yeah, he said he was reported missing by his friend. So this guy's next due in court, April 18th, apparently. Apparently he has obtained court-appointed attorney. But uh, he's not answering any calls, apparently. So we'll find out more on April 18th. Nancy S. says he has scary eyes. He does a bit. Like those kind of crazy eyes. A little bit. All right, how much longer do we have? I don't know, oh, we got to wrap up. Um, I'll get you guys to go to, uh, what do they call it? Woo Woo Night with Trish. Once she's finished with Woo Woo Night, we're going to do a bit more on Jennifer's uh, Cold Justice episode, okay? So come back after Trish. We're going to redo some of this, and then we'll be back, okay? Go have fun. Go listen to Spooky Stories with Trish, okay? Love you all. Hey, I want to thank um, Nancy S. Uh, for her monthly membership. And 
Sean and Julie for the donations in the last 24 hours. I really do appreciate it. It's very kind of you both. And um, yeah, we'll be back in like an hour and a half, two hours, okay? Be back. Have a fun listening to Spooky. Maybe they got Spooky Easter stories. That would be good, right? Maybe the Easter Bunny visited someone in their dreams and then, I don't know, something bad happened. I don't know. Go listen to Go listen to that. And then I'll be back with more diagrams, crime scene footage, whatever else, okay? Peace out. Love you guys. See you in a little bit. Bye-bye.